the handout you have has a brief description of the class. Today we are going to focus on really two things. How we got our Bible. I think that's important for us to start with as introductory material because we take it, we take the Bible so much for granted without realizing how many people have given their lives, some of them burned at the stake, um, in order to have the Bible available. I think that if we have a little bit of a historical understanding of what it has taken, what, what price people have paid to get us the Bible that we have today, I think we'll take it a little more seriously. And so I want to spend some time talking about how we got our Bible, languages, translations, <laughs> paraphrases, what all that means a little bit. Okay? Then I want to spend some time talking about the power of God's written word. In other words, part of that is why should we study the Bible? I'm going to be introducing you to several different approaches. In fact, next week I'm going to be talking about, I may even get to it today if I get excited about it. Um, we may get to what I think of, and this is, this is Ross Arnold's idea. There are four different levels of Bible study. The first level, and probably the first two levels, every Christian ought to be doing, and if they're not, then they're not growing in the Christian faith. The third and fourth levels, I think, uh, require a lot more work, and we should be doing if we really want to grow, but I'm, I'm realistic. You know, most of you are not going to decide I'm going to spend 20 hours a week for the rest of my life studying the Bible. But um, it's important. And so I'm going to get into those four different levels. But in order to be able to, that's a long way of saying, I'm going to challenge you all that this requires an investment. This is one of the most important things you can ever do in your life. Period. Did you hear me? This is one of the most important things you can ever do in your life. And you have to take it seriously. And so I want to talk a little bit before we end today on why is it that this is so important, and why should we study the Bible? Next week, we will look at approaches to personal Bible study, which involves asking the right questions, particularly uh, what are those four levels I was talking about. We'll begin to look at some of the different styles or types of uh, Bible study that Kay Arthur and Rick Warren talk about. Um, and asking the right questions really is the key, like it is to so many things in life, really is the key to effective Bible study. Is the camera on? Okay, good. Um, so now you've got me saying, is the camera on? Um, <laughs> it's on there. Okay. Um, the third week, we're actually going to get into using the NIV Study Bible. And what we're going to do there is I'm going to walk through the tools, why I recommend it, what the tools are in that. And I've been using the NIV Study Bible for a long, long time. Um, I got the leather version of this one for myself. But I have the previous editions of this. The new one, they have added a lot of other study materials and stuff like that. But this is what I use all the time. This is my standard Bible, the NIV Study Bible. It's the one I carry around, as big as it is. So we're going to talk about what's in it, why I think it's the Bible that we ought to be using on a fairly regular basis. Um, I, also, I have another Bible that I also use that I'll talk to you about. The, um, and then other important tools. Some of them you have heard of, you know, topical Bibles. Uh, word study, Bibles, Bible dictionaries, etc. We're going to talk about all those tools, and you'd be surprised to find out that almost every imaginable Bible study tool that has ever been created is free for you on the internet. All right. There are websites where you can get almost any Bible study resource you can imagine. I, I personally use a, a standalone piece of software called PC Study Bible, which I use for everything. Okay. It's other than this NIV study Bible, it's very seldom do I pull other books off my shelf, even though I have them. Because almost everything I need is on the, on the computer. Which is a good thing, because most of my theological library I gave away before I moved down here, because I had no idea I was going to come down here and be a pastor or a seminary teacher. Okay? So we'll talk about the NIV study Bible, what, what's in it, how to use it. Then we're going to spend three weeks doing application. I don't want this just to be theoretical. We are going to, to probably break up into groups. And um, each of the three weeks, I want us to look at three different approaches or strategies to how to do uh, Bible study using the tools. And I will guide you in that. You know, don't, don't panic about well, what does that mean. We'll get there. But I want us to have practical experience with figuring out how do you do this thing that we call Bible study. The, the seventh week, you'll notice there are eight, eight items here because it's eight weeks. The seventh week, we will look at creating a personal devotional life and what that means. So that this becomes part of your life and how do you apply scriptures. If you're studying the Bible, if you're learning from them, how do you apply that to your life? 
so that your life is changed. We're dealing a lot with information. What is the information in Scripture? But the, but the primary purpose for that information is transformation. And you'll read, when you read in Rick Warren and you read in K. Arthur, they both start out by saying that the Bible allows all of us to become the person God wants us to be. It's his, it's his guidebook for us. And so how do we begin to apply that to our lives? And then week eight, I'm going to talk to you about how you can lead others in Bible study. Starting this fall, um, we're going to start small groups here at Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Those small groups initially are going to focus on a book called Love Does by Bob Goff. So they will not be Bible studies, but that will. after that book, we will go into some different, different models. Some of them will be Bible studies. Part of what we need in our church, you know, here's, here's a little ad. Um, as we're growing, and we are, we, we need, I need to have more people to teach. We need to have more Bible studies. We have, need to have more people. As you go through this eight weeks, it is not only my desire, but my faith <laughs> that God will inspire a few of you to want to go on to the next level and help other people learn what you've learned, learn to open God's Word and grow from it and apply it to their lives. And so I'm, I'm hoping and praying and expecting that as we go along, some of you will feel like this has been the process by which God anointed you to help make the Bible more real in other people's lives. And I'm unapologetic about that, okay? <laughs> So, that's what our class is about. Now, two things I want to talk about first, which you saw part of this if you were here in Monday's class, is on what do we base our faith? I'm not going to go, there's four levels of things that we base our faith on as Christians. The first and foremost and most important, the most authoritative, is that our faith is built upon the revelation of God in Scripture. It is God's word to us. Now, sometimes this is called uh, special revelation or supernatural revelation. But God has miraculously communicated to us in his Bible, uh, in the Bible, in his word to us. This is God's living word that instructs us in our life. Uh, somebody recently said to me, another minister actually, that, well, you know, if we didn't have the Bible, we'd still have the church because we still have Jesus. Well, where do we learn about Jesus? Yes, the Holy Spirit touches our hearts miraculously with knowing that, that what we read is the truth, but this book is where we get the testimony of Jesus and who he was and what he did. This is the first and foremost authority on which our faith is built. And we believe it is the divinely inspired revelation of God to us. In fact, all of this, God's own revelation, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, later, but God... Some people have this idea that God is this mysterious, you know, who knows what God wants? Who knows what God is like? Uh, how are we, you know, how can you be religious when you, it's all a mystery, we don't really know what life is for. The answer to that is, clearly you haven't read the guidebook, because it's all in here. God has not hidden his will from us. He has not hidden uh, who he is and who we are and how we are expected to relate to him. It is in this book, and that's why it's our foremost authority. Secondly, the revelation of God to his church down through history. Specifically, God has spoken through the church. Even when there were great heresies going on, there's always been at least a remnant, and it's a biblical, uh, a, a theological concept, a remnant of people who maintain the true faith as the church. And that's especially as reflected through the creeds. The creeds are the church's efforts to basically write shorthand versions of the truth of the, of, the, of the Bible, mostly so we can recite them. I once had somebody argue with me, I taught a class on creeds of the church, um, and somebody argued with me that we don't need creeds, we have the Bible. The creeds are, are a human creation. And, and, we, and I said, try reciting the whole Bible on Sunday morning with a congregation. All right? The creed is a shorthand which... The historic creeds are true to the Bible. They, they are a shorthand version of the most important concepts in the Bible that God has given us. And so the church, I believe, has been led through the creeds to express God's revelation. Now that's second to Scripture. If somebody, if a church comes along, I don't care if it's 10,000 churches in a denomination, and they write a creed that has something in it that is not in God's Word, eh, no, because God's Word, the Bible, is the first authority. Um, the third is a revelation of God in the world, sometimes called general revelation. Scripture says that the, you know, the glory of the heavens declare God's, you know, the, the wonders of God's handiwork. If we're 
if we're alert and humble and paying attention, both the miraculous presence of creation and also the human mind, rationality. Those are the sort of general or natural law kinds of ways in which I believe God does speak. He reveals himself in that too. But again, secondary to the how God has spoken through the church in history and ultimately the highest level, how God speaks in scripture. And the fourth is the revelation of God to individual people. That's either to a person, because God does still speak to us through the Holy Spirit, or to a group of people, like a church. We believe that the session, our, our elders here at Lakeside Presbyterian, that we pray and we, we ask how God wants us to do his will and manifest his presence in, in the community as he gives us the ability, we believe God speaks to us in that. Now, if our session ever decided, well, we've decided Jesus isn't really the Son of God, or something else that's contrary to Scripture, then the answer would be no. But within the context of the other authorities, revelation of Scripture, God speaking through history, the natural revelation that we receive, or general revelation through uh, what God shows us in the world. My wife Carolyn, by the way, she's heard me a million times say the greatest failing of humanity is not paying attention. Because not paying attention keeps us from seeing the reality and presence of God in the world. But then, with those other authorities as being higher, you know, it's a hierarchy, still God does speak to groups and to individual people as we seek his will. Okay? Bless you. Um, any question about that? Or, yes, Michael. You, just real quick, do the creeds, when you talk about number two in this church, it includes the creeds, does it include confessions? Are they also like a Westminster? Well, the confessions are the creeds. It's the okay. same thing. Yeah. Um, in the, the uh, Presbyterian Church, there are two, and you don't have to be Presbyterian, but this is just an example, okay? Um, in our church, we have Lutherans and, that sit down front, and we have Baptists that sit in the back, and we have Methodists and you know, Presbyterians and, and Pentecostals and Catholics and all kinds of folks. Um, but as an example, we in the, the Presbyterian Church USA, we have two books. The Book of Order is the, the constitution of the church, basically how you do church, that you have elders and, you know, you, et cetera. The other is the Book of Confessions, starting with the Apostles' Creed, which we use the second week of every month in our, in our congregation. That's the oldest. It comes, the roots of it are in the very first century. Then the Nicene Creed, which was written in the 300s, is the second oldest creed of the church. We use that on the third week. But in addition to that, there are a total of 13 creeds, I think it's 13, with the latest ones, that have, gone, that have been written by the church down through time. The Heidelberg Confession, which was written by Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon as part of the Lutheran Church. There is the, the, Helve the Second Helvetic Confession, which came from the Swiss churches. We've got the Barman Confession, which was written by the Confessing Church in Germany during the Second World War as a declaration of why Nazism was contrary to Christianity. We've got the Westminster Confession, one of the, one of the great ones, which also has a catechism, which is used in training sometimes. Uh, and then down to two very modern confessions in the Presbyterian Church. Everyone we do, we get longer and longer and longer. You know, we get more long-winded about it. Okay, the latest ones are the, are the longest ones of all, which is why we use the, the two oldest ones, the shortest ones, as part of our confession of the church. But all of those have been evaluated by the church as being accurate confessions or creeds, statements of what it is we believe based upon Scripture. Some of them, like the Barman Confession especially, are written to address particular kinds of needs or, or challenges that the church has been facing at a particular time in history. The Barman Confession is glorious, it's beautiful, as, as a declaration of the faith in Jesus Christ against the political oppression that was existing. Most of the church in Europe, especially in Germany during the Second World War, went along with the Nazis. The, the people who didn't, um, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others uh, that, are, that you may have heard of, um, they became known as the Confessing Church, and the Barman Declaration was the confession or the creed that they used to, to do that. I'll do a class on the creed sometime, because they're, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, the beautiful statements of the faith. Questions about that? Comments? Okay. Yeah, confession and creed is the same thing. All right. A um, couple of other things here, then. Then, why is the Bible important to us? First, we believe that the Bible... I'm going to give you some quotes, and then we'll go into some, to, to some particulars. Uh, Chuck Colson, let me, I've got this someplace here. I'm craning my neck to see around the corner. All right. um, you can read that, but so can I. Um, Chuck Colson said this, The Bible, 
Banned, burned, beloved, more widely read, more frequently attacked than any other book in history. Generations of intellectuals have attempted to discredit it. We talked about that a little bit on Wednesday about the higher critics. Dictators of every age have outlawed it and executed those who read it, yet soldiers carry it into battle, believing it more powerful than their weapons. Fragments of it smuggled into solitary prison cells have transformed ruthless killers into gentle saints. It's interesting for Colson to say that because he was in a prison cell when he became Christian, not as a killer, but as somebody who broke the law for political reasons, okay, as one of uh, Richard Nixon's henchmen. The, um, the statement, soldiers carried into battle believing it more powerful than their weapons, um, Oliver Cromwell once told his soldiers during the, the Puritan Wars in England, may we have clean swords and dirty Bibles. Hmm. I like that. Cromwell had his problems, but I really like that. Um, hmm. William Jennings Bryant said, the Bible holds up before us ideals that are within sight of the weakest and the lowliest, lowliest and yet so high that the best and the noblest are kept with their faces turned ever upward. It carries the call of the Savior to the remotest corners of the earth. On its pages are written the assurances of the present and our hopes for the future. Harriet Ward Beecher, who was the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and he was a renowned minister and abolitionist, he said, the Bible is God's chart for you to steer by, to keep you from the bottom of the sea, to show you where the harbor is and how to reach it without running on rocks and bars. The Bible is very practical. It teaches us how to live. Abraham Lincoln said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good of the Savior of the world is communicated to us through the book, but for it we could not know right from wrong, or we, um, we could not know right from wrong. Again, people say, well, Jesus is more important than the Bible. Absolutely, but where is it that we learn of Jesus? The content of our knowledge of Jesus is in Scripture, and it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of the truth of that content. And last quote, Matthew Arnold, Uncle Matthew, to the Bible men will return. And why? Because they cannot do without it. No matter how much people try, we need it. A couple more comments about what we believe about the Bible. First, we believe that the Bible is revealed. As I said earlier, this is the highest form of God's revelation to us to us today, because it reflects the revelation that was in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah, chapter 30, says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in a book all the words, I have spoken to you. And that same message is communicated all throughout Scripture. We'll look at a couple other examples later. Secondly, we believe that the Bible is inspired. 2 Timothy 3, Paul writes to Timothy, um, his young student, All Scripture is God-breathed, God breathed, literally, uh, the word for the Holy Spirit in Greek is pneuma, which literally means breath. And so when it says God breathed, it implies very clearly in the Greek language that through the Holy Spirit. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Third, we believe that the Bible is authoritative. 1 Corinthians 15, again Paul writing, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. You notice this is that's the testimony that makes it valid. And that He appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. And finally, we believe that the Bible, the Scripture, is living. Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I asked this question earlier in the week when talking about uh, Old the Old Testament survey class. How many of you have ever read a passage of the Bible that you've read two, three, four, five, ten, twenty times before, and all of a sudden you see something in it you never saw before? that there's a new meaning that applies to your life. That's what I believe is the miraculous aspect that the Word of God is living. It adapts itself through the Holy Spirit to the needs of our life as we study it, as we read it. But of course that can't happen unless we study it and read it. All right.
I want to spend some time now talking about how the Bible came to us. Well, first I should say, any questions about that? Anything? We're good? All right. If you do have questions as we go along, please raise your hand. As I said earlier in the week, I get on a roll sometimes and need to be reminded that you're in the room, but I do want to answer your questions. Okay? Good. All right. How and when the Bible came to us. The Bible that we have is in two parts. The Old Testament, which is the Hebrew Bible. That's what we're studying in the Old Testament survey and Old Testament theology earlier in the week. And it's still not too late if you guys want to pick up those classes. And then the New Testament. The Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew. There are a few passages, a few sections that are in Aramaic, particularly part of Daniel, for instance. Aramaic was an, an, uh, another ancient Semitic language. It had been the language of the Assyrians. Remember the Assyrian Empire? And when Assyria conquered a lot of the, of the Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, Aramaic became a common language. Hebrew was the ancient language, of course, of the Jewish people. So, and, and a Semitic language. And by the way, you know where Semitic comes from? Noah's sons, one of Noah's sons was Shem. All of the descendants of Shem are Semitic, Shemitic originally in the language, but Semitic as it's transferred to us. And so you talk about Semitic people and Semitic languages that grew out of those people. That means those people trace their heritage back to Shem, one of the sons of Noah which is pretty far back. Okay. Um, so that's the Old Testament. The, uh, the, the Old Testament was written between the 1400s, we don't know the exact date, but in the 1400s, perhaps 1450, um, when the oldest books of the, of the Old Testament were written, the oldest books of the Old Testament were almost certainly Job and Genesis. Scholars disagree about which came first, but they were pretty much at the same time. The Old Testament as we have it is not in chronological order. Neither, neither the Old or New Testament are. Uh, for the most part, the, the, the English versions of the Bibles are ordered, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the books of the law, the books of Moses, they sort of set by themselves. But after that, the prophetic books, the, you know, and then there's some histories that are kind of in order. But then you get into the prophets, and the prophets are mostly ordered according to the longest ones first, just like in the New Testament. Romans was by far not the oldest of the books that Paul wrote. You know, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans is the longest one, and so it comes first. The shortest Paul, and they, they work their way down to the shortest books. I don't know who thought of that. I don't think it's a particularly helpful way to have them order, but it is what it is. And so because our Bibles are all created that way now, there actually is a book I mentioned earlier in the week called The Revolutionary Bible Approach, which takes the Bible and reorients it from a timeline point of view. And it's helpful to understand. For instance, Paul's writings, Paul's first letters, are Galatians and 1 Thessalonians. Again, scholars disagree which of those. If you read Galatians and 1 Thessalonians, Paul is very straightforward, and it's pretty simple. Because, you know, he's presenting the, the gospel in a, a simpler way, because he hasn't had as many years for people to ask him questions, and for him to have to respond to things, and so it's, it's not as complicated. You get later on, like Romans, although it's the longest one, um, Timothy, the letters of Timothy are probably the last ones, but Romans is huge. It's the theological treatise of the New Testament in terms of the theology of Paul, but it came quite a bit later once all of that had developed. So reading Galatians and 1 Thessalonians are helpful because you get a, the simplest version of Paul's gospel, especially Galatians. Okay? So the New Testament, the Old Testament between 1400 and 400 B.C., that's about 400 years before Jesus. And it was finished. There actually was a council called the Council of Jamnia in the first century where the Jewish scholars set the Hebrew canon. So it had been several hundred years. When I say set the Hebrew canon, that means they decided this is inspired by God. The word canon, or kanon in the original Greek, um, a kanon, the Greek the Greeks were famous builders, you know, the, the, all the temples and all that kind of stuff. The only thing they didn't do was invent the arch. They took their practical Romans to invent the arch. But um, in the Greek architects, when they were designing and building buildings, they had basically a yardstick. It was called the kanon. And that yardstick had to be perfectly straight, unbendable, and measured in a way that was reliable. So it was, it was straight, unbendable, reliable way to measure things. That word, canon, or canon, C-A-N-O-N in English, later became a synonym for anything that is straight, 
and reliable and unchanging. And so early Christians began to call the Bible, the scripture, the canon, because it was unchangeable, straight, um, it, it was the way we could measure our lives and make sure that we were on the straight and narrow kind of thing, all right? So canon means the authoritative, final, God-inspired version. In the first century, the Jewish scholars decided that the Hebrew Bible, as we have it today, our Old Testament, is exactly the same in terms of the total content as the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, it's called. Um, they, they have... It's broken up differently. They have a different number of books because they don't have a 1 Kings and 2 Kings. 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. You know why we have 1 and 2 Kings, Samuel, Chronicles? Because they used to put these things on parchment and make roll and glue them together and make rolls out of them. Well, those books are too long. If you take 1 and 2 Kings together, put on one scroll and roll it conveniently, so they split it in the middle. So we can put one on one scroll and one on the other. It became 1 Kings and 2 Kings, but it's really one book. And so in the Hebrew Bible, it's still one book. Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. The 12 minor prophets that we have separate, they call one book, the Book of the Twelve, but the same content, written between 1400 and 400 B.C., and, and, and sort of nailed down as being the definite you know, canon from God in the first century A.D., which means nothing can be added to it. Yes? My Bible says that Job was written earlier than Job and Genesis. Well, for, for earlier than 1450 or so? It says it was written in uh, 2800 BC. Okay. Um, there are differences. Some scholars disagree on those things. Um, that This is the generally accepted. That could be right. Um, the, the point is, it's really old. <laughs> um, I mean, it's like... Because I didn't even realize that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're looking, at the, but in all in the what's, what's it? Couple thousand. Years? Yeah, what do I? Remember? Yeah, a couple hundred years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> five or six hundred years. A couple million. Um, part of it is that, we, and I'm not going to get into this right now because you need to come to the Old Testament classes. Um, the way that it's been passed down to us, and I'll, I'll talk about just briefly in a minute. We don't have the original manuscripts. Mostly because it was written on parchment, which is made out of reeds that they that are sticky, and they would lay them out and invent in Egypt. These reeds, they would lay them out horizontally and vertically, and they would stick to each other, and they become sort of a paper, and you can write on it. But it was organic, and so if it got damp, what happens with anything that's organic if you leave it out and it gets damp? It rots. So parchments, for the most part, were all gone, and it was all originally written on parchment. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which I am going to mention in a minute, in the 1940s they discovered the most ancient manuscripts we have today were found in the 1940s, 47 and through, well, 40s and 50s, because they once they found the first ones, they kept looking and they found more in other caves over a number of years. Uh, because it was in the Negev Desert, which is horrendously dry, there is no water there. And so, so dry these things were preserved, and that's why the Dead Sea Scrolls were such a miraculous find. But we don't know, I mean, this is the generally accepted, some scholar, Whoever is responsible for your Bible feels like it's older than that. But Job and Genesis are considered the oldest of the books. Right? And we do know that all of them were, were finished by 400, 400 BC and nailed down at the Council of Jamnia in the first century AD as being this is the Bible. And one of the reasons that we don't we Protestants don't include the Apocrypha, you know, the books first and second Esdras, uh, first and second Maccabees, Tobit, etc. If you're if you have a Catholic Bible. There are books in the Catholic Bible that are not in the Protestant Bible. The reason they're not in the Protestant Bible, the Protestant reformers had two reasons. One, the Jews decided they weren't canon. In, the first, in Jamnia, in the first century AD, they said those books are interesting, but that's not part of, part, part of God's word to us. So the Jews didn't include them, and nowhere are they quoted in the New Testament. So the Protestant reformers said, we don't think they should be part of the Bible. Okay? I'm getting off track. Let me get back to this. The New Testament was written in Greek between, and again, you'll have a difference here, 49 A.D., some people say 51 A.D. for Galatians and 1 Thessalonians. Some scholars say Galatians was first, some 1 Thessalonians, uh, and, but uh, 100 A.D. Now, back in uh, the 1930s, the University of Tübingen in Germany, there's the Germans going at it again, Bob, tried to claim that the earliest of the Bible books were not written by any of the original characters. The earliest of the Gospels, for instance, they said was in the 300s. Well, since then, they have found, uh, they have found parchments, and uh, parchment be, being uh, made from animal skins, as opposed to um, 
Reeds. The, the Reeds, you know. Papyrus. Papyrus? Did I say parchment earlier when I said it was made out of reeds? Papyrus is made out of reeds. Sorry. Parchment is an animal skin that is scraped and used to write on, and it lasts longer. They have found parchments from the uh, one from the 100s, you know, before 200, that have the Gospel of Mark. And so the Tubingen School was out to lunch, and they've been completely discredited. Liberal scholars who tried to say this stuff was much, much later, in the last 70, 80 years, that's been pretty clearly demonstrated. They were wrong, and that yes, the, the writings are all of the New Testament are all before 100 AD. Some liberal scholars still argue about that, but almost everybody agrees with it now. Okay, Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, before the printing press existed, which we're going to mention in a minute, the Bible was copied very accurately, no, very accurately by hand by special scribes who developed intricate methods to ensure that no errors had been made. For instance. They would count the number of lines and the number of characters per line. They would make notes of, you know, the lines start with these letters and end with these letters. And then whenever a new manuscript was copied, they would have uh, senior scribes who would check and make sure that it all lined up, uh, that everything seemed to be accurate. Now, the li again, the liberal translation or interpretation of scribal copying, because all this stuff was done by hand until the Gutenberg Bible. Every book before Gutenberg Right? Every book had to be copied by hand. Nothing was printed. It's like imagining what it would be like if the only way you could listen to music was if somebody was there with a violin playing it in front of you. It's astonishing that we fail to realize how very recent it is we have recorded music. Well, it's relatively recent that we have printed books. Everything had to be done by hand. But these scribes were professionals, especially the scribes that copied the scriptures. They took this as, as their call in life. This was the most important thing they would ever do. Now, scribes existed in every culture before the Gutenberg press, in every culture, because the only way you could have things is if somebody copied them by hand. So you had professionals who did this, and they, they were good at it. But the Bible scribes were especially good at it. And the way we know that for a fact, see, liberal scholars up until the 1940s and 50s used to say, oh, well, you know, these scribes, when they copy stuff, you know, when you You've played the game of telephone before, right? You know what telephone is? Where you get a people in a circle and somebody whispers something in one person's ear and then they whisper in the second person and it goes all the way around. And when you get to the end, the person says what they heard and then you have the person who started it, what they said, and it's completely different, right? Invariably. Well, the liberal scholars used to say the same thing was true with, with scribal errors. That every time somebody copied this, and they've been copied thousands of times, that errors would creep in, or somebody would say, well, that doesn't sound right to me, I'm going to change that a little bit, okay, or whatever. But in the 1940s and 50s, um, we had an astonishing discovery in the area near the Wadi Qumran, near the Dead Sea, the uh, Negev Desert. In a, a series of caves, they found what are now the oldest Bible documents, uh, manuscripts available. They discovered them starting in 1947, as I say, once they discovered this, they started looking in a bunch of the other caves, and so the searches continued, and they found things up through 1956. These are the oldest Bible documents because they were in a very dry area. The scrolls were put in ceramic jars, and um, it's not all, not all the scrolls are Bible, but, but the majority of them are. They have some other things, too. And, uh, these were done by the Essene community, which was a sect of Judaism. Um, they have found portions, the Dead Sea Scrolls include portions of every book of the Old Testament, including especially, most importantly, the scroll of the book of Isaiah is, in, is intact. It's, it's complete, and it's one book, by the way. We talked the other day about the, the theories that Isaiah actually had two writers. Well, the Essenes didn't think so, you know, the oldest document we have on it. Now, when they got those Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll notice here, uh, when these newly discovered but ancient texts were compared to modern copies of the Hebrew Bible, scholars were amazed to find there were very few differences, none of which were considered of any theological significance. Yes, there were minor, you know, adding up, partly because of Hebrew lettering, you know, you can add just a, 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 an accent mark above something and change the word. And so you got very minor differences, but the liberal, scholars had to you know, eat crow because these documents, which we go back as far as the second century BC, they're all Old Testament, there's no New Testament stuff here, 
um, were virtually identical, and any, ch any variances were considered of no theological significance. It, it's not like, you know, oh, we found these ancient documents and they say that, you know, Mary was really a man, or that, you know, Jesus committed murder and was on the lamb in Galilee, or, you know, there's nothing that changes anything of import about our faith. And that is a great verification of the fact the scribes paid so careful an attention. And the thing they came up with is the, they had to admit, apparently the scribes who copied the Bible took this so seriously. Some of them committed their whole lives to this. They believed they were called by God to do this and do it right. And they simply didn't make mistakes, at least not mistakes of any consequence. Were, were, those, were those parchments or were they... Uh, Pepperoni. The very uh, the inquiry the, in, in the case. The majority of them, I think, like eighty-five percent of them, are papyrus. Yeah. There are a few parchments. There is one document that's actually written on copper, uh, metal. What's that? Your slide says mostly parchment. Oh, I'm sorry. It should be mostly mostly papyrus. I keep switching those two words. These mostly papyrus scrolls. The majority of them are papyrus. My mistake. That was what made it so fascinating because they yeah. were preserved, you know. Exactly, and, because of the dryness. Papyrus is the paper-like stuff that's made from reeds, invented in Egypt. Parchment is scraped animal skin. That's a mistake. It should say these mostly papyrus scrolls. And this is actually a picture mm -hmm. of sort of what they look like. Most of them are bits and pieces. In fact, they found them in the 1940s and they have photographs. Early on, you know, now you get a, you get an ancient document like that, and they take it in a you know an airtight room, and you have to wear you know hazmat suits to handle it and the whole thing. Back then, they took them, and you know they're smoking cigarettes while they're looking at this stuff, and they they hanging them on on the uh, on the tent tent pole wires and stuff like that. And you know we've got pictures of them standing around with really bright sun coming in on them while they're you know smoking <coughs> cigarettes and saying, "Wow, look at that one!" Oh, sorry, you know. And so. <laughs> They say that there has been more degradation over the last 50 years of the Dead Sea Scrolls than for the previous 2,000 years that they existed rolled up in, in these uh, caves inside the, the crockery, you know, the pottery urns. So we, they didn't, weren't treated very well. They didn't know much about taking care of ancient documents in the 1940s and 50s. But they're still there. Uh, and in fact, if you go to Jerusalem, there is a special museum, the Museum of the Book which includes a lot of ancient uh, texts and documents, but is the largest single collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls today. All right? So, talking about reliability, that they were shocked at the, the uh, reliability that was demonstrated from the Dead Sea Scrolls, let me give you an example. Reliability of New Testament manuscripts. There are currently, and this number may have changed since I wrote this, because they're still finding stuff. 5,686 Greek New Testament manuscripts are in existence today. You compare that number to any other ancient writing, the stuff that nobody ever argues about, the reliability of it, and we find that New Testament manuscripts far outweigh any other ancient documents, both in the number of copies we have, the quantity of them, and in the accuracy. Eighteen of the New Testament manuscripts that we have are considered from the second century. Now I'm talking about New Testament now, the Dead Sea Scrolls were Old Testament. New Testament, 18 manuscripts we have today are from the 2nd century, one of them is believed to be from the 1st century, and it includes part of the book of Mark. Okay, again, it's not 300 years later like the Tübingen University said. For instance, you may recognize some, some names up there, um, Pliny, there was Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Younger, Plato, Demosthenes, Thucydides, Euripides, Aristophanes, those were all Greek writers, Pliny was, was Latin. Uh, Caesar, Tacitus, Roman, Caesar being Julius Caesar, who wrote the histories of the Punic Wars. Um, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher. Sophocles, um, the Greek writer. Homer, and the Iliad, Greek. Uh, and then the New Testament. You will notice that the earliest copies up here, you've got the, the date of the earliest copies, right here. Date that it was written, the earliest copy, and then how long a gap there was between the earliest copy or the, the date it was written in the earliest copy. Meaning, how long was it between the time the guy really wrote it and the copy that we have? 700 years. 750 years between Pliny's writing uh, originally and the earliest copy. 1,200 years for Plato. 800 years for Demosthenes, Thucydides, 1,300, Euripides, 1,300, Aristophanes, 1,200, 
Caesar, a thousand years between Caesar's writing of the history of the Punic Wars and the, and the, the, the earliest copy we have. And on down through this, the New Testament, less than a hundred years between when it was written and the, the oldest versions we have. In terms of the number of copies, 7, 7, 8, 8, 9, 10, 10, 20, 49, 193, a whopping for Homer, 400, 693. New Testament, 5,686. The accuracy of copies, which we don't have documentation on that because we don't have multiples, you can't compare. Accuracy means looking at the oldest versions and then what, what happened later, how, how accurate are they able to, to determine. It's believed that the New Testament is 99.5% accurate. That is the New Testament we have today, based upon all the ancient manuscripts, and this was verified by the Dead Sea Scrolls for the Old Testament, for the New T Testament, the same thing with all of the different documents, 5,686. The, the consistency between them leads scholars to say that we have better than a 99% accuracy in terms of what we currently have today as the Bible. Yes? I don't understand what you mean by number of copies because well, in number, the 138 AD, you're not going to have 6,000 copies of the New Testament. Well, of, of ancient manuscripts. The oldest one, this is the oldest one is less than 100 years. And that include, that's the Gospel of Mark. We have other, others in the early 2nd century would be less than 100 years. Um, so this is how many total manuscripts do we have? We have a total of only seven ancient manuscripts of Pliny's writings. Okay? And so we don't even have hardly enough to compare to say how accurate is it. The earliest one we have is 850 AD, which is 750 years. So what we're saying is with the New Testament, the writing um, is in the first century AD, between 49 and 100, which is what I said earlier, the earliest copy we have is about 130 AD. So less than 100 years after that. Somebody has said that, uh, you know, liberal scholars used to say, well, you know what, the biographies of Jesus were not written in Jesus' life. They, they were a long time after Jesus. Somebody said the first biography of Abraham Lincoln was written longer after Lincoln's death than the biographies of Jesus were written after Jesus' death. And yet nobody says the biography of Lincoln can't be accurate because it took so long for anybody to sit down and write one. Mm. Okay? And yet, the devil making hay causes people to challenge those things when it comes to Scripture. This is just a way of saying we have more documents. They are closer. The ancient documents we have are closer to the original writing. And based upon the number of documents we have, we're able to say there's very little variation that has occurred based upon the many, many documents we have to compare. Does that make sense? But these weren't all found in the Dead Sea. No, no, no. In fact, none of these were. This is New Testament. Dead Sea Scrolls are Old Testament. Yeah, okay. These are found in a lot of other places. For instance, some of the most ancient ones, um, they're hilarious. They're hilarious. They're strange and funny and weird stories. Like uh, some of the oldest manuscripts we have are um, the from the 300s, but they're large bodies. The Codex Sinaiticus was found at the uh, Monastery of St. Catherine in the Sinai Desert. They only have the New Testament and a little bit of the Old Testament because they were using it to light fires in the monastery. Okay, and that's from the 300s. <laughs> Likewise, the uh, Codex uh, Vaticanus, which was found in the... Uh, did you know that the Vatican has basements and sub-basements and sub all the way down to bedrock, which is where they say Peter was buried somewhere down there? <laughs> And down in those basements, they have vaults full of stuff that nobody even knows what's in there anymore. They found, uh, back in the late 1800s, they found one of the oldest New Testaments, the Codex Vaticanus, it's called, which is the entire New Testament from, again, the 300s, from about the same time as the Codex Sinaiticus. So they're still finding stuff. All right, That's why I say this number may have gone up since, since I made this chart. But you get the idea. Do not listen to liberal, if you read liberal things about saying, oh, we don't know if this is accurate, oh, we don't have enough. It's more accurate and more reliable than anything else we have in terms of ancient documents. And no scholar who's, who's not biased would say otherwise. Okay? Yeah, you can just watch Hollywood. Yeah, Hollywood straight enough for you. <laughs> um, this gives you kind of a picture of how we come down to the English Bible. How did we get the English Bible today? Because, I don't know if you knew this, but they didn't write in English back in the day. Because they didn't know it. 
all you have to do is be, be a, a native Spanish speaker trying to learn English, and you'll know what they didn't write in English. Okay, I feel sorry for anyone who has to learn English from some other language. All right, uh, on this chart, you'll notice up here in the, in the, well, in the right, we have the Old Testament. Um, written in Hebrew, predominantly a little bit Aramaic. It was finished by 400 BC. The New Testament, you know what, I'm going to take a break. Because I'm getting into the English Bible, and I've got a few other slides I want to talk to you about that. So we're going to take a break. I have five minutes at heart. Upper right-hand corner, you'll see that it says the Old Testament Hebrew was finished by 400 B.C. In the upper left-hand side, coming in on a different track, you'll see the New Testament Greek was finished by A.D. 100. Scrolls were transferred to sheets of papyrus, not parchment. I made a mistake earlier on that in the slide. In various forms, coming down to here which is when the Latin Vulgate what became the standard for the church, because the church was only the Catholic church at that point. Now, I'll mention that to you in a minute. Jerome translated the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin for the Latin Vulgate, which was the standard Bible. From the Latin Vulgate, if you follow it down here, you end up with Wycliffe's Bible in 1384, the first complete Bible in English. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was written in Middle English. If you know anything about the English language, there was Old English. And then those darn French invaded England during the Norman Conquest, and they messed up the English language royally. That's why English is such a confusing language, because it's 70% it's a Germanic language and 30% a Romance language, because the French influence. Okay. English, in case you didn't know, is considered a Germanic language. It's got a lot of the same roots as German. French is a Romance language with a lot of the same roots as, as um, the Latin languages, Italian, uh, Spanish, etc. It's called Romance, not because it's especially romantic, but because it's based in Rome, from Latin. Okay. <laughs> oh, the things that you now know. <laughs> um, so, that's why English is so complicated, and when, um, when the first whole English Bible, Wycliffe's Bible, was, was written. It was written in Middle English because um, he, it was the combination of things. It was before English got refined into a form that we recognize today. Then, in uh, that was 1384. I'm going to give you some other slides on that. And then the Gutenberg Press, 1455, the first movable type <coughs> press, Johann Gutenberg, uh, 1455, the first book that was printed on a printing press was what? The Bible. the Bible, the Gutenberg Bible. Dog on it, I was going to bring you. I've got, I've got a 1611 King James Bible and a Coverdale Bible sheet and some other things. I'll show to you later. Um, you get from the original Erasmus translated the Greek New Testament, and that became a source for uh, for other New Testament. Tyndale's New Testament was based upon Erasmus's Greek. Over here, you get the first completed printed by uh, Tyndale's was only the New Testament. He didn't do the whole Bible as the first. Uh, pr uh, printed Bible, or Wycliffe, I'm sorry. Then you get Coverdale Bible, which is the first whole Bible printed in English, down here to Matthew's Bible, the Great Bible, Bishop's Bible, and uh, King James Bible, which was in 1611. I'm going to give you some slides about that, but you get sort of an idea of how the English Bible came to be. Now let's look at some particular slides. Major translation. I just mentioned that in 1410, very early, Jerome was asked by um, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome at that time, uh, Damasus, to take the various fragments of Hebrew and Greek and various other things we had and come up with one consistent, there had been various other translations into Latin, but to come up with one that could be the authorized version. So he did, he translated it, took him 25 years to do the Old Testament and the New Testament. He used mostly original Greek and Hebrew documents. He did not use the Septuagint for the Old Testament. In um, the 4th century BC, the Hebrew scholars had translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek because a lot of uh, Jewish people no longer could speak Hebrew. So the Septuagint, which used some very ancient Hebrew documents to create the Greek translation of the Septuagint in the 4th century BC, Jerome didn't use that. He went back to the original documents. And because of that, it took them a couple hundred years to really accept Jerome's Latin Vulgate Bible. But when they did accept it, it became the Bible of the Catholic Church. And at that point in time, the Catholic Church was the only church, the only Christian church. So it became the standard authorized version of the Bible for the church. All right? Yes? Did, did that have the, the uh, 
uh, Apocrypha and all that stuff? Was uh, that part of that? Actually, what happened was the Septuagint, when the Septuagint was written, they included some of the intertestamental documents because they thought it was useful to translate them into Greek because historically they were interesting, but they did not consider them canon. And then in the first century, the Jews went back and said they're not canon. It's, in fact, this has been so confusing, we're not going to put them in there anymore. Jerome also said that those extra books, the apocryphal books, 1st and 2nd Andrews, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, Tobit, you know, etc., um, that they were um, deuterocanonical, meaning second level canon, meaning they were useful to read, but they weren't the same as Genesis to Malachi, which was God's word. Okay? Jerome said they were deuterocanonical. Then, uh, basically, despite the Protestants, when the Council of Trent and the Counter Reformation came along um, in the 16th century, they said, well, yes, they are. You know, and so they made the whole thing, including the Apocrypha, all canon. Well, were they the included in the Vulgate? They were. Okay. Yeah. But Jerome was very clear that they're Deuterocan, they're second level. They're not as important as the rest of it. All right? So it became the official Catholic Bible. Do stop me if you've got any questions about this. I think it's useful for you to hear this stuff. Then you get Wycliffe. The first English Bible was translated from Latin in 1382. It's called the Wycliffe Bible in honor of the Oxford scholar, John Wycliffe. He didn't do all of it himself. Um, the Wycliffe was a strong advocate of the Bible being available to every common person. In fact, he said every plowboy in England should be able to read God's word in a language they can understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to understand that, that at this time, in fact, it says the Bible was banned and burned, and then 40 years after Wycliffe's death, his bones were exhumed and burned for heresy. This was a period of time with the, in which the Catholic Church said only the magisterium of the church, meaning the authorities of the church, the pope, the bishops, <coughs> the priests, were able and therefore could translate or interpret the Bible. This was when the Bible was in Latin. Most people didn't speak Latin. This was when the, the church services uh, were, the masses were all in Latin. Most people didn't understand what they were hearing. And so the church insisted that the, the Bible could not be translated into common language because they were fearful that it would be misunderstood if you didn't have somebody interpreting for you. And so they literally burned people, they killed people, for translating the Bible into common language or for distributing it. Wycliffe was not himself martyred, but 40 years after his death, they dug up his bones and burned him to make a point of the fact they thought he was a heretic. Okay. Other question. Help me. Uh, where was the Reformation? What, what was the year of the Reformation? Reformation started in 1517, so it's the 1500s. So you're 200 years later. Yep, exactly. Okay. 1517 was the year that uh, Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses or challenges. There were questions. There were in the form of questions, like to the Catholic Church, saying, why do you do this? Um, and there were 95 of them. And that started the Protestant Reformation, even though Luther didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. He just wanted the Catholic Church to clean up their act. Okay, but it didn't work out that way. Then you get the Gutenberg Bible. The Bible is the first book ever printed. It was printed in 1455. Um, and Johann Gutenberg from Germany was responsible for that. And there are still Gutenberg Bibles available. It's a huge thing, as you can sort of tell from that picture. Okay. Uh, it's interesting that the Gutenberg Bible, the original ones, there were no, you see all, all of this sort of scroll work and everything else? He printed the original Bible without any of that in there. And so he had kind of these, these dummies with just the type. And if you wanted to buy one, you paid extra to get it fancied up. You know, they would, have, they would then have calligraphers and artists put in all sorts of scroll work and capitals and, you know, colors. And, and, and it's just how much you're willing to pay for it in terms of what kind of, what kind of extras you get. Uh, great marketing. So, so that's Gutenberg, Johann Gutenberg, German. Then you get another German. Um, in 1522, remember 1517 was when uh, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. On his way, he went to the Diet of Worms. You know, why would anybody want a Diet of Worms? Uh, but he, he went to the Diet of Worms, which is a gathering of the church in the city of Worms. That was the famous scene in which they, they called on him to recant his heresy. And he said, if you can show me in Scripture that I am wrong, then I will recant. Otherwise... I stand before God, I can do no other. He refused to recant. Well, on his way home, he had been given promise of safe passage. 
But on his way home, the word had gotten out that the church had sent agents to, to kill him. So he got kidnapped by the Duke of Saxony, a royal, the, one of the royalties who supported Luther. He was a Protestant, actually, an early Protestant. He, wasn't, he agreed that the Catholic Church had some problems back then. Well, he, he grabbed Luther and locked him up in, in his castle um, in Wurtburg for sort of protective custody. You know, and he was there secretly. Well, he was there for a long time, and while he was in the castle of Wurtburg, the Saxony castle, he translated the Bible from the original Hebrew and Greek into German. And when he did that, two things. One, he made the Bible available in common language of German for the people, but he did something in some ways even more extraordinary, and that is he wrote the German language for them. The German language was a hodgepodge, and it was un... un you know, there was no one... If, how many of you have studied German and you know the difference between Hochdeutsch? Uh, it, right now, if you study German in school, you will study Hochdeutsch, which is High German. If you try to go to Bavaria and speak Hochdeutsch, nobody will understand what you're saying. Okay, because they have very distinct regional differences. Well, it used to be a lot worse than that. And Luther, in writing the German Bible, it was responsible for significantly codifying or clarifying and setting in, in, in place what the German language was going to be like from then on. So Luther was a significant contributor to the German language. And by the way, in the 15th and 16th century, the two most important individuals in the 15th and 16th centuries were uh, Johann Gutenberg and Martin Luther. Both Bob Klemke were Germans. I was accused of being anti-German earlier because I was talking about how German theologians and you know in the 19th and 20th centuries caused so many problems. Yes. The Gutenberg Bible then was in uh, Latin. Um, it, it was in English. It was in English. No, 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 wait, no, German. No, no, it wasn't in English. It was in Latin. Sorry. It was in Latin. Yeah. Do it. And I'm getting confused. Okay. So now we have a German Bible. Now we get back to the English Bible. That's what I was thinking about. Ten days. William Tyndale is called the father of the English Bible because uh, his translations laid the foundation that were the basis of the later King James, or the authorized English language version. Uh, Tyndale was a priest and a scholar, and in 1525 he translated the New Testament from Greek to English without the approval of the king. Okay, this was back when not only the church, but the civil authorities. You know, we spent, we've spent most of the last 2,000 years trying to figure out the relationship between the church and the official uh, ruling governments, and we still haven't figured that out. Um, the, uh, so the king of England, and you, you, well, I'll mention Mary Queen of Scots in a minute, England especially went through periods where they had Catholic monarchs, and then they had Protestant monarchs, and then a Catholic, and then a Protestant. And every time they changed monarchs and they had a different viewpoint, the people suffered for it. Okay, well, in this case... Tyndale translated the Bible into English from the Greek without the king's approval. He was persecuted for it. He fled to Germany, and from Germany, he arranged to smuggle these English Bibles into England for the sake, especially of, at that point, of the, the Protestants. Protestantism was just getting started, but the people who were against the restrictions of the Catholic Church. In 1536, Tyndale was arrested, found guilty of heresy, tied to a stake, strangled to death first, and then his body was burned. And that he was actually, they were doing him a favor because they didn't burn him a lot, which they sometimes did for that sort of thing. His last words, which were prophetic, was, Lord, open the eyes of the king, open the king of England's eyes. The next year, one year later, the king of England authorized an English translation. One year after Tyndale was martyred for trying to have an English Bible. Um, a man named John Rogers published under a pen name, because when he started this, he still wasn't sure they weren't going to get him for it. He published a book under the name Thomas Matthew, which is called the Matthew's Bible, with the king's permission in 1537. Um, in fact, he... he honored it, or he honored William Tyndale by dedicating the Bible to him. And at the back of the Old Testament, they have huge block letters of, of William Tyndale's initials as an honor to the fact that a year earlier, William Tyndale had been killed because he was trying to do what now the king had decided was okay. Um, later, Thomas Cromwell, you all have heard of Cromwell and the whole roundhead Protestants, you know, uh, Puritan kind of thing. 
Cromwell was an advisor to King Henry VIII, and he had um, the, a man named Coverdale revise Matthew's Bible to create what was called the Great Bible. Again, big Bibles. It was official from the government, and in fact, uh, after Cromwell had it commissioned to write this translation, this, this translation or version of Coverdale's Bible, it was put in every church in England by order of the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, who, by the way, later was executed <laughs> for not being Catholic enough. Okay? A lot of these people ended up martyred for their faith, and a lot of it had to do with their belief about the Bible. The, these great Bibles, as they were called, were put in all these churches, and they were big things, and they were expensive. You know, this, it cost a lot of money to produce one of these things. And so they wanted them to be available for people to see and even read from. In England, they had to pass a law that if you were read, people would read them out loud, that you could not read them so loud as to interfere with other people who were trying to worship. So they had a law about that. But they called them the chained Bible because they literally would have to chain them to pillars or to permanent uh, permanent pulpits, or else they were afraid they'd get carried off. And this is a picture. You'll notice the chain right here? This is a chained Bible, a great Bible that was chained to an un not unmoving uh, Bible pulpit. <laughs> then we get, I mentioned the, the Catholic and Protestant rulers, the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible. We come back to where Queen Mary, Mary Queen of Scots, who, as is noted here, was called Bloody Mary because she so persecuted Protestants. You know, this was when, you know, cousins and nieces and nephews and stuff were trading off on the throne, and, and they kept, different ones had been raised in different places. Mary had been raised in Scotland. This was before the Scottish, Scottish Reformation, which led to Pres Presbyterianism, by the way. And so she took power, became Queen of England, and she started persecuting. And so a lot of these uh, Protestants <coughs> in England left to go to the continent, particularly to Switzerland. Uh, two of the guys I mentioned earlier, Thomas Cranmer and John Rogers, were both burned at the stake by Mary for not being Catholic enough. The Protestants in Geneva, Switzerland, and Geneva, Switzerland is where um, John Calvin was. John Calvin is the founder of the Reformed faith, which Presbyterianism is based on. Um, they produced their own English version of the Bible called the Geneva Bible. In 1560, it was a, a revision of the Great Bible, but they did some original translation from the Hebrew. Then, after Mary was gone, Protestants came back in. Elizabeth, you know, Elizabeth I, the great Elizabeth I of England, who was Protestant. Okay, she takes over. She doesn't like the idea of having an English language Bible. The Geneva Bible is popular, but she thought if we're going to have a Bible in England that's in English, it ought to be produced in England by English people, not those runaways that are in Switzerland. So instead of the, um, the Swiss Geneva Bible, they have the Bishop's Bible, it was called, produced in English. And from that point on, it, it, it was not as hard. It was not the same persecutions. That, from 1568, the next big point we have is in 1611, King James, who was originally James of Scotland, King James called together a bunch of scholars, six teams of scholars, totaling 54 men. Sorry, the scholars were all men back then. Um, to, and he commissioned them to do a new authorized version of the Bible in English. They used Tyndale's Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and earlier Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. I say earlier, the earliest Greek and Hebrew, the earliest Greek manuscripts at least, I'm sorry, the earliest Hebrew manuscripts, um, were destroyed in A.D. 70. I mean, the, the most ancient Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Bible, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70, everything got burned. And so the most ancient of the Hebrew documents we might have had otherwise were destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 70. So when we say ancient Hebrew manuscripts, we're not, we're not talking that far back. But the King James Bible, as it came to be known, from uh, King James, or uh, originally James of Scotland, was completed in 1611, immediately became known as the authorized version, even though the king never did finally give his approval for it. Um, he did commission it, but he didn't finally approve it. It's been, it was revised many times, and for more than 300 years, it was the most popular Bible in the English language. It's still popular today. We just celebrated the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Okay. Um, uh, that was last year, 1611, 2011. And so the King James Bible in the last year has had kind of a revival of interest, and they come out with lots of editions with extra, you know, beautiful 
prints and all that kind of stuff in it. Um, the, the version that has been most commonly used in English was a revision done in 1769. Okay, now I'm going to give you two lists here of modern translations. After the King James Bible, 1611, revised in 1765, in 1885 we have the English revised version, which was a British revision of the King James. 1901, the American Standard Version, revision of the King James in American English, because we all know American English and British English is not the same thing. All you have to do is ask somebody who is who's from Britain or New Zealand or anywhere where the, the King's English or Queen's English is still spoken, they don't think we speak English. Right, Roz? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> we, have a, we have a New Zealand friend who's always honest about the, about the American English. Um, 1926, the Moffat Bible was a modern translation. We begin to get into more modern now, Smith Goodspeed. In 1952, the Revised Standard Version, or RSV, um, was a revision of the American Standard Version, and it was revised again in 1971, as New Testament was. The Revised Standard Version had became one of the most popular American ones. Um, I've got a bunch of Bibles up here. Um, my Bible, for many, many years, the Oxford Annotated Bible, any of you particularly who from England, uh, this, this was my study Bible when I was a counselor, a junior counselor at Bible camp, and it's got a names and addresses of some of my friends from there. This was the Bible I used for many, many years, and, and it's a uh, Revised Standard Version, so it originally would have been from 1950s, okay? You can tell it was dirty, clean sorts and dirty Bibles. I, I wore this one out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then the J.B. Phillips, New Testament in Modern English, is a paraphrase. Let me tell you what that means. Translations are where they go back to the original languages, and translate them into English or into German, or whatever the language is, okay, where they look at the Hebrew and Greek. A paraphrase is where they take an older English version that maybe the language has changed some and they reword it so that it's easier for us to read today, okay. Um, some, sometimes the King James, you know, the thou's and these and prayeth not and all that kind of stuff, some of the uh, books that have come out have been paraphrases of the King James, which means they just take that language and they make it more readable for today, but they don't go back to the original Hebrew and Greek. That's the difference in a translation and a paraphrase. Two of the most popular paraphrases, or one of the most popular paraphrases ever, is the Living Bible. Okay, And it says right on the front, paraphrased. This actually is a Living Study Bible, which is mine. It's signed by Ken Taylor, who was the translator, who was the paraphraser for this, from Tyndale Publishing House. Um, it was a gift to me when I was working on that kind of stuff. The Jerusalem Bible, if you have a Catholic Bible, it's pretty high likelihood it's the Jerusalem Bible, because that was translated by Roman Catholic scholars. The New English Bible in 1970. The New American Bible is an official version of the Catholics Bible, revised in 1986. And then, after the Revised Standard Version, the Bible that I used for a long time was the New American Standard, which came from 1970. This is a Master Study Bible, New American Standard. I used this for, for ages after um, the, I used the Revised Standard Version. You're getting the history of Ross Arnold Bible Study. Uh, then, the Living Bible came along then. I mentioned it earlier. Then, the Good News Bible, which is a paraphrase. Um, initially of the, of the New Testament, today's English version. I remember my mother at one point, I didn't come from a Christian family, my mother came to faith I think later, um, but she wanted to be able to read the Bible and couldn't read the King James, and so I got her a Good News Bible, New Testament. They used to make it with little stick figures in it, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. You know, sort of illustrations all the way through stick figures, that was the Good News Bible. Then, um, the New International Version, which is the version that I went to from the American, New American Standard, this came out in the 1970s. This was when I had just graduated from college. The Old Testament editor for the New International Version was the father of a good friend of mine. There was a couple, Richard, Grace and Richard Sears, and Grace's uh, uh, father was uh, R. Laird Harris, who was the Old Testament editor. And so we got early, I, I actually got early versions of the New International Version, because he got copy, they got copies of them and gave it to us. So I got very much into the NIV for that reason. And then in 82, they came out with the New King James Version, which I have up here somewhere. Um, okay, this is the Word and Life Study Bible, which is New King James. I've got these up here. I thought you guys might want to, if you want to look and see what the different translations and versions are. Um, 
the uh, I, the only thing that I have, and I got this from the back of the King James. I could I was in a hurry and couldn't even find it by King James. This is New Testament Psalms. Don't ever buy a Bible that doesn't have the whole Old Testament in it. Is that clear? <laughs> New Testament Psalms, they're leaving out two-thirds of the Bible. Two-thirds of God's revelation to us. The Old Testament is important. If you don't believe that, come to my Old Testament survey in, in theology class. Um, then, very quickly, you get a number of other versions. The, the New Living Translation, which is a revision of the Living Bible. And then the New International Reader's Version. You see here, a simplified version of the NIV with third or fourth grade reading level. If you think that's a strange thing, you need to understand that the average reading level in the United States is third to fourth grade. Um, that's just, in, in, if any, my wife is a writer, okay? If you're writing for common consumption, it has to be written at a fourth grade level, or people won't read it. And it doesn't mean that people are stupid. No. It, it just, it, even people who have a lot of education just find it a lot easier to read. Yeah, and that's what, I mean, if, you, if they pick up something that is at a 12th grade reading level, they start it and they go, ah, oh, this is too much work. And they set it aside. Because, and it's not because we're stupid, it's because we're lazy. <laughs> and so oh, it has to be something that's, <laughs> not that I have opinions about this, uh, but it has to be something that people can read. What was that? What was that? Oh, I missed something. Not that you have opinions. Not that I have opinions about this. Then you get um, several others. The message here. This is the message, the Bible in contemporary language. This is a paraphrase by Eugene Peterson. He was one of the professors at Regent College, uh, where I did my THM, um, printed by Nav Press. It's a paraphrase because what this is, Eugene Peterson went through the Bible, and he simply reworded it in a way saying, this is what this, is what this means to me. This, and it's beautiful, and I recommend this to people who aren't used to reading the Bible. I recommend this, but I say the same thing that Eugene Peterson says. Do not think this is... The Bible. It's Eugene Peterson's version of the Bible in contemporary language. It's his sort of meditation on it. I think it's wonderful for people who aren't used to reading the Bible. It's great because Peterson is a, is a great man of God. He's very humble, but he's brilliant. And so it's very helpful. But he says, don't read this as your only Bible. You know, I know churches that this is their pew Bible. This is the Bible they always use. And Eugene Peterson stays awake at night worrying about that because he doesn't think that's right, even though he's the one that did this, okay? Um, you get then the Holman Christian Standard Bible. This is a study Bible I have in the Holman Christian. This is a good study Bible. It's got a lot of maps and pictures and cool stuff in it. Um, and it's a good translation. So part of what I'm trying to tell you is there's a lot of stuff. And then today's New International Version, the NIV um, Bible, they continue to make revisions to try to make it contemporary, to make sure that they're using the late, latest scholarship. The NIV is the Bible I use. But I actually prefer the older NIV translation to the today's New International Version because they've made some choices that I am not thrilled with stylistically. I don't think their scholarship's bad. I don't think they're incorrect. The perfect example to me is the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Well, there's always been a question as to whether or not that means the, 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 the Hebrew, the old Hebrew means shadow of death or just means very dark. And so the old NIV said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Today's NIV says, though I walk through the darkest valley. I don't like that. <laughs> I like the valley of the shadow of death because that has a depth of, you know, that grabs you in the gut. Darkest valley. You know, big deal. <laughs> Get a flashlight. I, um, so, so I, I don't care for that, but it's not because it's bad scholarship. It's because they've made a choice, and, that, and that's always the case. I mentioned that, just a second. I mentioned this in Bible study. There's basically two kinds of translations that exist today. There is a literal word-for-word -word translation, which the New American Standard and some others, they will take the Hebrew words and translate them exactly into English. And then they just sort of rearrange them in order that the sentences work. Because Hebrew, like German or anything else, the order of the words and sentences is not the same as English. The example I used in Bible study this morning was, in German, open the door is machen Sie die Tür auf, which is literally make you the door open. Well, that's not how we talk. And so word-to-word -word translations, literal word-to-word -word translations, translate the words from, English, from Hebrew to English or Greek to English, and then they rearrange them so they make sense to us. The other kind of translation, which the New, New International Version is, is what's called a dynamic equivalent 
where the scholars read the, the, the verses, read the words, and they say, what does this mean, and how do we most accurately represent that in English without feeling like we literally have to translate every word? Okay? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think it's better because you get better meaning and it reads more easily, etc. Okay? Rob? Just briefly, the difference between how they translate it, blessed, to happy. Yeah. Yeah, there's it's a big difference in blessed and happy. You know, and yet some, some translations have gone, happy is the man. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm happy if there's good music on and the sun is shining and my belly's full. That has nothing to do with blessedness, which is a much deeper thing than that. Okay? Happy is dependent upon circumstance. Blessedness, joyfulness, is dependent upon something much deeper than that. You can be blessed and joyful even in bad circumstance. Okay? Um, so, I agree. I want to spend our last 10 minutes here talking about why study the Bible. Unless there's some questions about any of the rest of this, okay? Would you just repeat your definition of the dynamic equivalent? Dynamic equivalent, the scholars will read what the original language says, be it Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. And they'll say, what does this mean, this, this passage? So it's almost like instead of looking word by word, they're looking at phrase by phrase. And they say, what does this mean and what's the best way that we can, we can communicate that in English. It's not a paraphrase. They still stay true to the English, to the original languages, but they, they're they a little less bound to translating literally word by word by word by word, and they're rearranging it. They think more in terms of phrases and translating phrases and sentences in a way that gets, <coughs> that really gets across the best meaning. And I think the best translations, to, to my mind, in terms of communicating the truth of Scripture, tend to be dynamic equivalences rather than literal word-by-word -word translations, okay? All right, I want to talk for a few minutes about why study the Bible. As Christians, as saved people, washed by the blood of the Lamb of God who is Jesus Christ, we have a question we have to answer in our lives. Once we are saved, what do we do with our lives? You know, what are we supposed to occupy our time with? Yes, you can spend your time playing golf all the time. You can play bridge. You can, you know, God gives us enjoyments and hobbies and things like that. But as a believer, how do I experience my Christian faith? In effect, I did a series before the current series in church on becoming a mature Christian. Jesus says that you know, there are two ways, there are two objectives for us as Christians. To grow in our love for God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, which is why we have this institute, and spirit, you know, uh, we are supposed to grow in our love for God and grow in our love for our neighbors. You know, that's the first and greatest commandment is love God. The second is like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. How do we do that? How do we grow in our love for God and our love for one another? Well, particularly, that's another way of saying, how do we become more Christ-like? How do we become more what God desires for us to be? Well, it seems to me that the most obvious point is we cannot grow more like Jesus unless we know what Jesus was like. We cannot grow more like God unless we know what God was like. We cannot be more what God desires for us unless we know what God desires for us. And how do we know those things? How do we know what God is like and how he has interacted with the humanity? How do we know what Jesus is like? How do we know what God wants of us? Well, there's really one primary answer. And yes, the Holy Spirit speaks. But in this book... God has given us answers to all those things. <clears throat> That's the main reason why we need to take seriously the study of God's Word. Because this is where we learn how to love God more, to be more what He wants us to be, how to love our neighbors more. Two passages I want to read to you, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, two texts. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9, which is the last of the books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, which are called the Torah, the Law, or the Pentateuch, which means five books. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9 says this, Hear, O Israel, this is the Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is what Jesus says in the New Testament when he's asked what's the greatest commandment. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This, by the way, do you know what a phylactery is? The Orthodox Jews, when they pray, they have this thing <coughs> they 
bind around their arm. Okay. Well, that has, there's a little box on it. And they have a little box that they tie to their forehead. That has scriptures in it. The uh, uh, mezuzah, you know what a mezuzah is? In a Jewish household, there's a little plaque that they will nail to the door face. If you ever go up to a house and you look over and there's a little thing that looks like a box, uh, the Ten Commandments, a little metal, whatever, mm -hmm. that's a mezuzah. In it, there are scriptures. So they take literally this idea, tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. So the Jews, being very literal, they literally do those things if they're Orthodox Jews. But the point is, God says, I'm giving you these commandments. They need to be on your heart. You need to teach them to your children. You need to talk about them when you're at home, when you're walking down the road, when you lie down, when you get up. How are you going to do that if you don't know what this book says? Because this book is the commandments. This is what it's talking about. The second passage is from 2 Timothy. I quoted part of this earlier today. But as for you, Paul writes to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and what you have been convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second Timothy what? That's 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Old Testament, New Testament, both say, do you want to become what God wants for you? Do you want to grow in your Christian faith and to become a whole person? Then you have to have God's word on your heart, in your head, on your life, that this is where you gain wisdom unto salvation and wisdom to life. You want to know how to deal with the struggles of life? You want to know what God's will is for you? Study this. God has not been silent. He has been very clear in communicating what He desires for us, who He is, who we are. Okay? I think that for me, it's very simple. We study God's Word, first because God told us to. <coughs> Secondly, because there is no better way to know how to live. And it's very practical. I said that earlier. The book of Job, I said it earlier in the, in the in other classes, the book of Job is the best essay ever written on how to deal with suffering and grief. And that's true for even for people who aren't Jewish or Christian. It's been looked at as a piece of literature that has influenced you know, literally hundreds of millions of people down through the, the, the centuries. If you want to learn about worshiping God, Psalms. If you want to learn about wisdom, what it is and how to get it, Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. If you want to know what's wrong with people, why we're so broken and why there's so much evil in the world, the answer is in Genesis, in the fall. And on and on and on. God told us to. It's practical in terms of a way to apply it to our lives. And if we don't understand God, if we don't understand humanity, if we don't understand how to live, it's because we're not paying attention. There's a story, and I've used this, this uh, story or joke before. There's a man who was a, a man of faith, and he prayed to God to let him win the Irish sweepstakes. Okay, this was when the Irish sweepstakes was the big lottery. And he said, God, if you'll let me win the sweepstakes, I will use the money for good. I can pay off my own debt, but I'll have a lot left over, and I'll do good. Please, God, let me win. He didn't win. He didn't win. He kept saying, God, why won't you answer? I am a man of faith. Please let me win. And he kept praying and praying, and nothing happened, and nothing happened. He didn't win. He said, finally, God, why won't you let me win the sweepstakes? And finally, God responded, and he said, well, you could at least buy a ticket. <laughs> if you do not feel that you understand what God wants for you, it's your fault because you have not looked in the place where he has told us all that we're looking for. So people throughout the world, throughout history, have looked for the truth. They've looked for the meaning of life. They've looked for what God is and how to understand him. And I don't know about you, but when I was in college, people are reading the, you know, the ancient writing of the Upanishads from ancient Hindi writings, and they're looking at this, and they're looking at that. This Swami and that guru and this latest truth. You know what? Everybody's looking for truth and it's right under our noses. It's so available to us we don't pay attention to it anymore. We think this is too easy. 
It's all right there. It can't be in that book, because that book's been on my parents' coffee table since I was born. Okay? And yet the truth is in there. Everything you're looking for, God wants you to know He's revealed it to us in here. That's why we need to study the Bible. It's the answer for our lives. It's the truth we've been looking for all the time. And even if we're believers in Jesus Christ, as we struggle with our lives and how to live that out and what to do, this is where we find the answer to that. Okay? I believe that with everything that is in my soul and heart. And that's why we're here. Because over the next seven weeks from now, eight weeks total, we are going to be looking at how do you study the Bible? And next week I'm going to introduce you to what I think are four levels of study. And we're going to get into some of the readings that um, from K. Arthur and from um, Rick Warren. And it's going to be fun. Before I give you your assignment for next week, any questions? Right. 1568, I missed in the genealogy of the Bible. Uh, do you remember that one? Yeah, 1568 would have been when the Bishop's Bible was written. That's the English translation because they didn't like the fact that the, there was a Swiss Geneva Bible. Although there's not a huge difference between them. Any other questions? Now, may I make a comment? Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting that, that God in all of his power and all of his might chose to communicate himself through words, through yeah. language, through a text. And when you look at what we have here, this Bible, uh, there's a, there's a, there's, I would suggest that there's another approach to it that's not as pragmatic, and that is this intersection, this, this communion with him is through what he gave us. And the Bible is that link between the earthy and the heavenly, you know, that that tangible link that God's given us so we can right. communicate and fellowship with Him. And I think in our day and time, we often reduce the Scriptures to something that we can make our lives better. And, and that's true, it does, yeah. it does. But it's, a, it's also a, a, an enormous um, pathway to a communion with Him that otherwise might not be there. Right, which to me ultimately is the foundation on which an improved life is built. Until we get that basic, that it is communion with God and improving that communion with God is the foundation which Scripture gives us, the spiritual aspect of it. Then none of the rest of it is going to make sense. I mean, it's practical in, other, in real life ways, uh, and you know, practical how you live your life, but it's also mostly the idea that in this we find how we are to relate and yeah. communion with God. Now, um, it is true, let me, and, and, and let me say, that the principle of accommodation I didn't mention. Accommodation is the theological idea that God has accommodated himself to us. He has spoken to us in words we can understand. He has revealed himself to us. Jesus came down as a human being to earth in order to rebuild the bridge between humanity and God, to rebuild that fellowship that we were intended to have originally and that got broken by the fall. Um, that's the kind of accommodation that God is bending over to us to accommodate our needs rather than expect. Because we can't climb up to heaven. We can't climb up to God. We cannot perceive the mysteries of God unless he chooses to communicate them to us in ways we can understand. And that's what the Bible is. Okay? Um, lest you think um, I'm saying something I'm not, you, the Bible will not save you. Okay? Jesus Christ will save you. But the witness, the the permit, the... Uh, the initial witness to Jesus Christ is the Bible. That's where you find it. And then the Holy Spirit affirms that in your life as being true. So Jesus saves. The Bible doesn't save. It's true. Some people, I think, are guilty of what's called Bibleolatry. And that is they think the Bible itself is something to be worshipped. It is not. It reflects God. It reflects Jesus, His Son. Through Jesus, we're saved. Okay? Um, assignment for next week. Could you get the escape key? I can't. Let me do it. I think it Well, shucks. Of all the times for. Okay. <laughs> McAfee just decided it was going to clean up my act there. <laughs> like it could. Okay. In the K. Arthur book, New How to Study Your Bible, next for next week, read pages 5 to 14, which is introductory material. And in Rick Warren's book, Bible Study Methods, pages 9 to 47, 
These are, this is a requirement for people who are a certificate or degree. It's a recommendation for people who are not if you purchase the books. Okay? Questions? It's not a lot. And these two books, unlike those of you who have the Old Testament theology class and got the, the Anderson book on contours of Old Testament theology, this is very easy reading. The letters are even big. So it should not be, it's not, it's not a lot to read in a week. So you're not gonna have you're not gonna have to have as somebody told me a dictionary in one hand and you know the internet on the other to try to figure out what it's talking about. All right, thank you all, God bless you.